This is Fearless Beauties, a podcast dedicated to elevating voices of color in the beauty industry. We're talking to estheticians, skincare specialists, and business owners to uncover best skincare practices, tactical career tips, and ultimately, how we can create a better beauty industry together. I'm your host, Mary Nielsen. And I'm your other host, Taylor Phillip. Welcome to the seventh episode of Fearless Beauties. Today, we're discussing something that isn't talked about enough in the beauty industry, gender bias. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about gender. A man in the beauty industry is often assumed to be gay, and men coming in for services are often stigmatized as effeminate. Taylor, what are your thoughts about these misconceptions? Yeah, I agree with you, Mary, 100%. I would add that men coming in for services are also assumed to be gay, or they're either pressured by their significant other, meaning that they're forced to pamper themselves instead of wanting it for themselves. But that's, of course, a stereotype. For example, men can want facials without their sexuality or their masculinity being questioned. Also, some men can portray some internal gender stereotypical assumptions, meaning, for instance, they come into a spa, they're asked what they would like to be done, and to protect their manhood, they say, oh, well, my woman thinks I need a facial, so here I am. You know, it's just the curse of society pushing these gender norms. Well, culturally, beauty is definitely a female-dominated industry. I've done a bit of research, and I think that some of it's related to the male dominance in our culture that then gets reflected in the imbalance of power. Somehow, we've established a culture where men have grown up feeling ashamed to show their feelings or feel that they have to be hyper-masculine. You know, boys don't cry, that kind of thing. Take it like a man. That actually caused me to think about Kyle Rittenhouse. He's the 17-year-old who shot several people during the Kenosha, Wisconsin riots this summer after white police officers shot Jacob Blake seven times in the back. I just don't know what was in this young man's mind. And now in the minds of the people who are coming forward to defend him as a hero, saying he was protecting the city. Taylor, I really always value the way you incorporate your knowledge of psychology into what we do. What are your thoughts about this? Are there reasons why the feminine focus in beauty contributes to male toxicity? Well, I think it all starts at a young age. For men, or I should say boys, they grow up learning that they must wear blue or green, not pink or purple. Or you play with cars and action figures, not Barbie dolls and makeup. It's society's way of making that distinction between male and female. But then there are, oh, boys don't cry. Boys are supposed to glorify cuts and bruises. It makes you into a man. Girls are fragile, so they cry if they get hurt, and that's okay. The gender schema theory says that children create gender associations from their culture. When a child develops, they learn particular behaviors that are linked to both their sex and the opposite sex. So bringing this into adulthood, if a man believes they may be portraying feminine traits, some toxicity can develop simply because they are not only going against what they were taught, but also going against society driven definitions of masculinity. These beliefs influence their behavior. And since the beauty industry is so female dominated, like you said, Mary, there is a lot of pressure on men to stay in their lane. Therefore, the men who really love working in the beauty industry, there is some tug from society and probably their friends and family on what their roles should be in life, putting them into this bubble and subsequently causing some tension. Now, of course, I am not a man, so I think it would be enlightening to hear about this from a male's point of view. So we decided to do some investigating. The first person we chatted with was Ralph Cole of Skin by Ralph Cole. His experience as a student was pretty eye-opening. Well, I asked him if he had any experience with gender bias, and this was his answer. Actually, my last client that we had uh, during clinicals right before, you know, we graduated, a lady came in and I guess she was a, you know, a recurring client there at the school. And when I walked up, she was out in the the lobby waiting and I walked up and I was, you know, introduced myself and told her that I'll be her esthetician for the day. And just to look on her face, she was like, oh, I wasn't expecting you. And even by her saying that, 
I already understand or could get what it was that she was implying and everything. But I was like, you know, don't worry about it. You know, you're in good hands and all of that. But then she even proceeded to say or even ask me, oh, okay, well, like, do you know what you're doing? And I was like, wow. And at first it was like, it, it was really a shock to me. And I was like, how could you ask that? Would you have asked any other student that? Like if, if it was one of, you know, my, my classmates or whatnot, would you ask them the same, you know, question if they was to come get you? And, you know, for me, I looked at it to where, okay, I'm not going to make an issue about it, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to bring her to the back. I'm going to give her the service and I'm going to give her the best service that she's ever received here at the school. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did, you know, and, and I could tell that at first she was nervous, but uh, some of my classmates even heard her comment. And, you know, even when she was walking out, there was like, man, like you, you lucky because, you know, they wish that they could come to me and get a service too. And the lady was like, wow, like that's, that's the best service she ever received. And not only that, she wanted to get my information so that after I graduate, she wanted to come to me and continue getting services wherever it is that I work at. I think Ralph did the very best he could considering this situation. He kept his cool and then he really stretched to give the client the best service. But it also struck me that he had to do more to validate his abilities just like we've heard from other black skincare professionals that they have to be twice as good to get acknowledgement as a professional. What are your thoughts about how Ralph handled himself in this situation? Well, Mary, I think he handled himself like a pro and he made the best out of an awkward and unfortunate situation. His emotions could have really messed up his chance of gaining what sounds like a permanent client. But I like how his attitude was like, oh, I am going to show her. I am going to give her the best service she has ever had. And that's the attitude of success. Like despite some judgment and hesitation from the client, I'm going to do what I love and I'm going to do it well, period. And I love it. He didn't let anyone, including himself, get in the way. And as we heard, the client was really surprised that Ralph was her esthetician. How can we change the narrative around gender and beauty for future generations? Well, that is the million dollar question. I think there's so much inequality that exists between genders in the workplace, the roles at home. That's clearly evidenced by statistics that say that women are paid less, less frequently promoted. And there's a competitive bias that really limits women's abilities to get ahead. Women get described with negative adjectives, being called a bitch. Men are described as showing leadership. I think that Kamala Harris, the first woman VP, is a perfect example. She's had to have incredible drive and determination to move into this level of leadership and power in a political field that is dominated by white men. I think that it's slowly getting better. There's more at home dads. I know my son-in-law is the primary caregiver in my oldest daughter's family. They have really shifted things so that my granddaughters see their mom as being empowered. I have to tell you, I had a hard time with it. When she said, I'm going to be the breadwinner and he's going to stay home, I just thought, wait a minute, I don't know how I feel about this. It took me several years to come around to the idea that, okay, my, my grandchildren are getting the best parenting possible. But I think that social media shaming, calling people out for being discriminatory, that's really created some change. Anyway, I know you have an opinion about this as well, Taylor. Yeah, you're darn right I do. <laughs> well, I think that it stems from gender bias, of course. Women stay home and take care of the kids. They're more likely to put their careers aside to be moms. Like you said, Mary, like, why can't we do both? Women in corporate America, we must tread lightly with any sort of male-dominated field just in case the male feels overstepped and embarrassed. On the other hand, men bring home the bacon. It's more acceptable if they miss important family events because they're providing for their family. Male leaders make sure to hire people who they aren't intimidated or threatened by, women. But if they hire a man, they definitely make sure that they're put in their place. Men lift off the hierarchy and their ego, where women focus on nurturing, support, and collaboration so women are always treated as more fragile and less than. 
But in order to change the narrative, not only in the beauty industry, but across many industries, we must adopt equality. The competitive nature and putting people in their place, that's causing such a divide. Men have to respect a woman's hustle, education, and overall what she can bring to the table and vice versa. I love how we're discussing this as women. I really do. But I noticed that not a lot of men talk about this. So let's hear what Ralph had to say about this. It really showed me how big of an impact I can actually make within not only the industry, but even like with the climate of the world right now, how a lot of times there are a lot of women or female and male, you know, separation because there's less of an understanding of each other. I can see that I can be really the bridge to that and be able to, you know, open myself up to maybe start going to, you know, these women empowerment uh, ceremonies or, you know, some of these brunches and everything. And maybe just, you know, be the voice for men that say, hey, like, we're, we're not y'all enemy. If anything, we we care about y'all just as much as, as much as y'all care about yourself. And not only that, there are a lot of uh, women that are or that have been in terrible situations with men. And I totally understand that. And, and vice versa, you know, as far as men dealing with women, um, because even one of my classmates, the way that she grew up, she's been like, you know, kind of traumatized by different uh, males and stuff in her life. And as soon as she saw that I was going to be in her class and she saw that I was a straight masculine male, already her guard has been up since day one. Toward the end of the program, you know, me and her became phenomenal friends, like great friends. But at the beginning, like she didn't even give give me a chance to show her what kind of guy I was. And it and it was even some issues that had came up or whatnot. But not because of me, but just off the fact that I'm a man. So, you know, even with that, I just feel like I can make a huge impact way more, you know, just by me being in this woman dominant industry to where I can allow women to feel comfortable enough to even allow me to be that voice to to show them that it's okay to have, you know, conversations with men or all men don't think alike, even when it comes to us being around women. Ralph mentioned that there's a separation between men and women. Statistics show the lack of women in the STEM industries and how ingrained our culture is in directing young women to careers that are considered more feminine or that they're discouraged from entering fields that are more male dominant. I also know that marketing is highly sexualized and that creates division. Taylor, what are your ideas about how we can be better allies to one another? Well, I think that's a great question. I want to say that I understand gender roles and I understand that there are just things that women could do naturally that men cannot and that men could do things naturally that women cannot, which is why we all need one another. But what I do think in regards to becoming allies in professional settings is that men have to begin to engage in positive interactions with women in order to lessen prejudice and bring on more inclusion. On the other hand, women who are often seen as the disadvantaged group must accept men's willingness to support equality and become allies. Now, we all know men have an ego. So as women, we have to keep this fact in the back of our minds. To engage male allies, more efforts are made towards sex exclusion when men believe they have an important role to play. This means that We have to accept them with open arms in order to set that example of fairness and justice. Women, it's that internal fire that motivates men. And men, when advocating for gender equality, when learning about women's professional challenges, it's just best to interact more and not less. Women aren't placing blame. We just want to be heard, understood, and respected. For men in a female-dominated industry, I think it's important for women to give the same respect, the same respect that they would expect. I think it was interesting that Ralph thinks of himself as a bridge. He's a straight male esthetician in a women-dominated industry, and I think that his desire to create more trust is really admirable. Rather than viewing women in the industry, his peers, as competition, he's looking to create more collaboration and support. 
do men need to have a seat at the table when we talk about female empowerment? Well, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we must adopt equality, equality from for women who work in male dominated fields and equality for men who work in female dominated fields. Women have been fighting the good fight for equality for decades. Now, with male nurses, male primary caregivers, male teachers, male hairstylists, and of course, male estheticians, the fight is on both ends. Equality has a greater chance if both genders are benefiting. So yes, men do need to have a seat at the table when discussing female empowerment. To listen with sincerity and empathy, no mansplaining, but rather engage in supporting partnerships And that's what you can do as men to support women's efforts to break this marginalization and discrimination. Powerful words. Well, I know when the feminist movement was originating back with Gloria Steinem, now that really is dating me, and Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique in the 1960s, if you agreed with the notion that women needed or deserved roles bigger than being a homemaker, the word feminist had a real negative connotation. You had right-wing pundits. They called us feminazis. And it made it seem like you were a man-hater when what you really wanted was just equality. Taylor, what do you think from your perspective? Does that perception still exist? Well, I know you said that you dated yourself a little bit. And I'm not about to date myself, but I will go back a little bit further And quote the words from Surgeoner Truth. And these words are, if my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? This is an excerpt from the poem, Ain't I a Woman? And that took place in 1851. Now, of course, I had to look up the exact words, but I remember this poem from college when I recited it for my speech class. It's just amazing the things you remember. But anyway... With these words, Surgeoner Truth made it clear that despite the gender differences, there's no need for women to be handed less. Surgeoner's words had a dual purpose then. One, for racial freedom for Blacks or Negroes. And two, gender freedom for women. I believe this fight continues now. And it extends to both sides of gender bias. Women are not trying to take over, nor are we man-haters. We simply want our measure full. So yes, this perception definitely still exists. Well, after hearing this from Ralph, I was curious about one of my students, Adam Merkel, had to say. I feel like there was a long time where, I mean, even on TV shows, just, you know, growing up as a kid, I'm sitting with my parents watching TV and it's like, Not all stuff that would come on the TV at that time was accepted, but it was just because of the stigma and the world we had going on. And like you said, there is a huge shift that had happened and that shift really changed everything for everybody because now we're allowing other voices from people that were almost perceived as like someone on the opposing side, if that would make sense. Someone that a transgender or gay client would think, you know, they they would never accept me. Those are the people now that are finally coming forward and saying, no, you're okay. You're perfect the way you are. And I feel like this is the like perfect opportunity to tell those voices as well, to add in all the other things that we need to be covering and that you are covering. I completely agree. I just think about, you know, me, when any sort of gay character was on TV, they were always somewhat of a comic. It was like mm-hmm. a comic relief, sort of a comedic character that couldn't be taken personally or or seriously, or didn't have valid feelings. Yes. And then you see the shift with, and I'm thinking one of the ones of um, Orange is the New Black. Yes, Laverne Cox, she she really just took that show and just changed it for the better. But the thing that was amazing about it was that she was the first, I feel like, transgender actor to get on a show, and that's not all she was. She was the character and she made the show, but she wasn't just a transgender actor. Adam and I talked about LGBTQ plus representation in pop culture. I know with your expertise in LGBTQ plus studies, Taylor, how does this contribute to breaking down gender barriers? Well, I just want to say that I love Orange is the New Black. And once I saw Laverne Cox for the first time, I ran to my computer to stalk her and see what she was all about. But I have done a lot of research on the plight of the LGBTQ plus community. And to answer your question, I think more positive representation in pop culture 
for both gender and sexual minorities is slowly breaking down barriers. Of course, it's normalizing a population that has been fighting for equal rights for so many years. And although sexual orientation is more accepted today, LGBTQ people still struggle with microaggressions and homophobia. And I think we have mentioned this in previous episodes with how seeing more diversity in marketing allows minorities to feel included because they're seeing people who look like them being highlighted. And the same goes for sexual and gender minorities. Seeing a gay man or a trans man or woman highlighted and represented in marketing or just highlighted as a strong and successful force in the beauty industry or any industry, period, will motivate people like Adam to feel like, okay. I got this. If he or she can do it, I can too. And that's the motivation we all need. And I believe that if we continuously do our best to combat this oppression that the LGBTQ community struggles with, that's stopping their self-shaming, genuinely accepting their sexual and gender identity, educating ourselves on the issues and what this community faces, and also asking how we can help. Doing all that, we are going in the right direction to break down the barriers. Well, you're right that that diverse representation is so important. We need marketing and advertising to reflect our diversity. We know that people need to see people who look like them. If you only see the Eurocentric images of beauty, we're failing in our efforts to be inclusive. We need to see the BIPOC community in places of leadership, moving towards equality in all aspects of our lives. And that's going to influence future generations. I know today we can celebrate Kim Jackson, the first LGBTQ senator elected to represent Georgia in the election we had a few weeks ago. We need to be making changes in the systemic and institutionalized racism that exists in education, finances, housing, the legal system, et cetera. I mean, Taylor, after you listen to Adam, do you have any new insights about what we can do to invite all genders to be a part of the conversation? What needs to happen? Well, I mean, those that have such a strong and influential voice must lead by example because it starts with our leaders active commitment to make a more inclusive space. Use your voice to bring attention to gender inequality. And since we live in the age of technology, use your social media to create change. I think that bringing in more diversity in marketing is not enough, but really listening to what males and females of all backgrounds have to say. Really listen. So, for example, allow men in male-dominated industries to discuss what they believe they should be doing more of. And the same for women in women-dominated industries. And bring women in male-dominated industries to the forefront and ask them what they would like to see change. And bring women in male-dominated industries to the forefront and ask them what they would like to see change. And the same for men in women-dominated industries like Ralph and Adam. Well, I spoke to Onisha Clare, the owner of Bossy Brows, and she had some really interesting insights about this. We have to speak up, you know? So for you to ask, right, that's one way of speaking up. For me to ask, sometimes these people live in bubbles, right? Sometimes they, they, you know, and I'm the type of person where I don't believe that the world is against me or anybody that looks like me, my gender, any, I, I don't believe that. But what I do know is that people live in bubbles. We all live in our own kind of bubble. You know, I'm surrounded by good looking people. If you ask me, the whole world's just good looking. And so by us speaking up, I think it's these organizations job to listen though. So this is a culture, this is a cultural issue. Onisha talks about bubbles. Our individual bubbles inform our decisions. A personal example that I have actually relates to COVID. I spoke with a school owner who lived back in the Midwest several months ago, and she felt that the COVID risk was just overblown. She didn't know anybody who had died. She didn't know anyone who'd been tested positive. She didn't know anyone who was sick. She thought we just needed to buck up, open up the country, let people who get sick, get sick, recover. We need to build immunity in our population and move on. And so then I have another friend. She has lost her father and her brother to COVID. And it has devastated her family. It's created emotional pain, but also economic disaster. They are just living in different bubbles. 
Taylor, what kind of examples do you have about bubbles? Being the first American-born child on both sides of my family, my dad's from Trinidad, my mom's from the Bahamas, I definitely have heard and experienced how bubbles motivate closed-mindedness. So many decisions are made based on cultural traditions or just opinions. At times, being intolerant of another culture, another way of thinking, it stifles growth. What resonates with me are the reactions to politics in my family. So four years ago, my political views and those of my family were opposite. Being from a collectivist culture, the Bahamas, my family members tend to collectively choose who they're supporting. And they will feed you opinionated facts, I like to call them, until you succumb to their views. But I'm an individualist. I am of the mindset that my choice is simply that. It's my choice. And my decision not to conform caused a little bit of a rift between us. And I was seen as a rebel. And I was okay with that. But there was no listening, no tolerance of my views, and no support. However, Somewhere along the way, their political views changed. And I believe it was kind of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing. So for this election, although there was smooth sailing in my family, the closed mindedness still exists. There was no growth, only change. But I do want to piggyback off what you said about our bubbles and forming our decisions. It's totally true. Like if you think about it, our bubbles are our safe place and we do our best to get others into our bubbles because that's where we have power and that's where we kind of control the narrative of what's going on is to make us feel more comfortable. So like the person who you talked to who didn't believe anything about COVID being a risk or in my family who are closed in their political views, the bubble symbolizes their defense mechanism of keeping reality at bay. So I don't know, maybe it's out of fear or ignorance of the truth, but yeah, bubbles can be really dangerous. I think being stuck in your bubble leads to unconscious bias and the perpetuation of stereotypes. We need to be open to moving out of our bubble and really do some work for personal accountability. And I think that's not easy. But I think we need to get out of our bubble, look for people who are not like us. An easy way to do that is look on social media and then follow them. Try to get a new perspective and see their point of view. You know, I followed some people who I thought were like really out there because I realized that social media and news media algorithms are designed to keep sending us the same message and viewpoints that we already agree with. So then we end up getting similar content in all of our news feeds unless we're actively searching for something different. Yeah, I love how you put that, Mary. It's so spot on. But just to bring us back a little in regards to gender bias and beauty, how can female estheticians try to understand their male counterparts perspectives? Well, that's a good question. I think, again, we're just going to circle back around to communication and respect doing the work, encouraging educators and leaders in the industry to offer more diversity and inclusivity, being willing to just step up and have conversations with estheticians and skincare professionals who are underrepresented in the mainstream. I know you've got some good ideas as well, Taylor. Well, yeah, after asking you the question, I kind of thought of communication as well. It sounds like a duh moment, like Duh, we have to communicate in order to understand others' perspectives, but it really is something we overlook. Communication. It's actively listening to what these men have to say and value their opinions. Ask them questions and then provide them with leadership positions in order to highlight their talents, in order to normalize seeing men kick butt in the beauty industry. Onisha also discussed speaking up when it comes to large corporations, which is something we covered on our last episode. But why is it important to speak up about gender representation, Taylor? Well, Mary, how else will we ever get men and women equal rights, the same opportunities, equal pay, etc., without speaking up? If we keep our mouths closed, there will be no change. You know the term, closed mouths don't get fed? It is imperative that we start taking charge, both men and women, for gender inequality. I read an article about the gender gap in Asia. And just to sum it up, it said that women make up half of Asia's population and contribute to 36% of their wealth or national income. But 
only 12% of them are on companies' boards, and only 3% of them make it to chief executive positions. Now, just imagine if more women were put in leadership positions in Asia or anywhere. And not to keep out my men, but the same goes for them in women-dominated industries. It only makes sense for the best people, whether you're male or female, to do the job. I think if it makes sense, don't leave out men and women because it's not what is usually done. Women can be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, just the same as men can be owners of med spas. It's whatever their heart desires, and it's living up to your potential. This episode has been filled with three amazing speakers who were so candid and open about their experiences. I truly loved hearing from them and getting to know them a little bit more. And there were some really eye-opening moments. Well, I had several aha moments. Ralph was just so honest and vulnerable with his perspective about wanting to build relationships and be a bridge. I thought his perspective was really refreshing. And Adam's insights into how transgender acceptance is shifting. What were you most surprised about in this episode, Taylor? Hmm, I would say Ralph's story. I did not appreciate the reaction he received from his client, but I'm also not too shocked. I just want more normalization in the beauty industry, and we'll get there. What do you think, Mary, we can do to improve the gender gap in beauty and make everyone feel welcome? It requires, I think, just some introspection and recognizing the circumstances around you and then doing some work. I know at Spectrum, we have partnered with the Q Center in Portland and also SheBop, which is a woman-owned sex toy boutique, but they both have the mission of providing a healthy understanding of sexuality. So we have speakers come in and provide education and awareness to our staff and our students. We promote our school as a safe space. And then transgender clients can come in for services and they can feel more acceptance. Well, I would say the key lessons I want listeners to take away from this episode are that it should not take so much courage to speak out fearlessly about gender inequality. But it does take all of us, men and women, to make a difference. And I think today's episode highlighted some important issues Men go through the same thing that women do. It's, it may not be as much, but if we want to put an end to sexism, we have to work together. Listen, communicate, and do what's right even when no one is watching. Thank you for listening to Fearless Beauties, a show dedicated to elevating voices of color in the beauty industry. I'm your host, Mary Nielsen. And I'm your other host, Taylor Phillip. Until next time, keep educating yourself, remember to stay open, and be fearless in the pursuit of creating a better, more inclusive world. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Special thanks to my co-host Taylor and our producers at Quill Inc. For the next two weeks, we'll be taking a holiday break, but we'll be back on January 7th. In the meantime, stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, We'll see you in the new year.